Littering is not a new problem. Throughout history, managing the waste that humans produced has always been an issue. Whether burning or burying garbage, we're littering in some sense. The modern idea of littering conjures images of aluminum cans, plastic bags, and cigarettes on the side of the road. Materials are what have changed over time, not the practice. Prior to industrialization, most waste that was produced was organic. With the introduction of single-use items made of plastics, common litter no longer quickly decomposes and presents a myriad of environmental and public health problems. In the 1960s, manufacturers, many of which produced the common litter we see along the roadways, took action with anti-littering campaigns. Uh, the Coors Company is a good example of this in Colorado. The campaigns relied heavily on aesthetic value, litter being the blight on the landscape that was the individual's responsibility to remove and prevent in the first place. In response to these campaigns, many environmental groups challenged these companies for shifting blame to individuals who were only practicing the consumer habits of the average person, viewing the industry response as an anti-regulation as opposed to some altruistic measure taken against littering. Instrumental value also comes into play in some anti-littering campaigns with discussion of human and ecological health that is threatened by waste. These campaigns rely on prescribing the categorical imperative to the situation. What would the world look like if everyone littered all the time? In the early 1970s, litter was becoming an extensive issue in Colorado, and people began to address the problem from its roots. In 1972, drink and food cans made up to 41% of roadside litter in Colorado, this is why the Chorus Company began to invest in ways to lessen the issue. Their products came under heavy scrutiny and people were now asking if this litter issue should be blamed on the consumer or the producer or even a third party. The following year of 1972 does show improved litter results than the previous year, even though there was about a 10% increase in roadside traffic according to Colorado traffic records but this was nowhere near the end of solving the litter problem. Looking at a piece of work called Water, Pollution, Air Pollution, and Now This from the Denver Post in 1966, one can see the anxiety that this litter was creating in the people. So in the photo, there is a man holding an overflowing trash can labeled Coming Trash Crisis with food cans and other rubbish splashing into a dark sea where you can see the pollution spreading. The man and the trash can are practically the same size, and in fact the trash can is even taller than his head, which is really just showing how overwhelmed humanity was, and he is holding his head back as he wails about the crisis and what it has done to the air and the water. This was clearly an issue that the average man was scared about and was wanting answers, as he knew this was just the beginning of the problem in the 60s. The air is full of heavy smog and factories can be seen in the back, which likely are contributing to the beginning of the trash problem by its creation. These large buildings in the back may also be incineration plants for the copious amounts of trash at the time. This all of course was before clean air acts were installed to save people from the fatal effects of burning large sums of trash and plastics. In the corner, there are three guys looking upset, and one of them wordly exclaims, and then there's us muggers on Capitol Hill. I believe these three men represent the group of people actually responsible for the litter crisis, the politicians. Men like these and others part of large companies had to begin implementing policies due to this litter issue. For a contemporary case, we decided to look at Singapore which prior to 1968 had a massive littering problem, but due largely in part to a huge littering campaign done by the city of Singapore, it is now one of the cleanest cities in South Asia. The littering campaign came with steep fines and punishments for littering that kept getting worse as time went on. Uh, for dropping or spilling liquid without picking it up, it can be as much as 2,000. For discarding furniture or a car, you can get charged up to 50,000. And for throwing litter out of a moving car, you can get charged up to 50000 or spend 12 months in prison. Um, all of these fines are just for first offenses. As a second or third offense occurs, they get worse and worse with fines and jail time. Um, 
Today, these fines and punishments might seem absurd to foreigners. However, they seem to be working because Singapore is the cleanest city in South Asia. Um, the Colorado case of littering really valued aesthetics and public health. And the case in Singapore has the same values, but for a slightly different reason. Singapore does value public health. Before the littering campaign, littering was so bad that disease would spread on the streets and a lot of people were getting sick. Uh, the way it's different, value, uh, Singapore values aesthetic values because they thought it would boost their economy through tourism and hopefully bringing in other businesses. The categorical imperative also does apply to this case as well because the city spends $87 million a year on cleaning services. Locals seem to be littering more and more because they don't think it's their job. When the littering campaign first started, a lot of the locals were on board and would help clean up their own waste. But as time went on, the new generation has just been used to the city picking up after them, which is leading to them littering more. Um, there's 56,000 registered cleaners in Singapore that pick up after these people, and it just leads to uh, more littering. To wrap things up, both of these campaigns were effective in some ways and not so much in others. The Coors Colorado campaign effectively established the idea that consumers should be responsible for their litter. Over time, this idea aligned with the values of the people. Although it took decades of litter in Coors cans and hearing the company tell us to clean them up, we eventually prescribed the method of recycling and throwing away trash. This was seen in the increasing recycling percentages throughout Colorado. On the other hand, Singapore's cleanup campaign was successful in the sense that they got a ton of trash off the streets and began to attract tourists and boost their economy. That said, the overuse of cleanup crews and money spent on cleaning created an atmosphere that the citizens didn't value. They were being stripped of their property rights and freedom of expression in order to walk along streets with no trash. At what cost is it worth it? Instead, we recommend spending less on cleanup jobs and more on littering education so that every citizen can do their part without requiring payment. In conclusion, a balance between these two campaigns would be the best response to waste management. You cannot expect a process like recycling and trash cleanup to last if you don't teach the people why it is important. Spending less money on cleaners and more money on education may have helped Singapore's case. On the other hand, Coors spending more money on cleaning up their own mess rather than leaving it to the consumer may have mitigated their trash footprint. It is important to remember that our cultural values lead our decision making. Singapore valued a boosted economy, and they got the results they sought. Colorado companies like Coors and Pepsi, on the other hand, valued environmental health and environmentally conscious people among them. In turn, both campaigns were successful in their own light, depending on whose values you prescribe to.